Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for showing up a little bit early today. There'll probably be some other people that'll be moseying in. Uh, so we have four presentations today um, by some of our visiting medical students. The first one's going to be presented by Anthony Lenner. He's coming here from Storm Eye in South Carolina, and he's going to be presenting, as you can tell, on management and staging of keratoconus. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to present a little bit of work I uh, did today in conjunction with our cornea department, uh, specifically George Waring, Dr. Waring. So I have no disclosures, but Dr. Waring is a consultant to Visiometrics who makes the uh, double pass scattering device investigated here. So as you know, keratoconus is a primary corneal ectasia or bulging of the cornea that's relatively common. About 1 in 2,000 people will develop keratoconus. It's asymmetric yet bilateral and is characterized as progressive and is not associated with any inflammatory condition. It is, however, associated with Down syndrome, Turner's, as well as Leber's congenital amaurosis, mitral valve prolapse, retinitis pigmentosa, as well as Marfan syndrome, and in those who are chronic eye rubbers, such as those with allergic eye disease. Oh, in our interactive slide of the day, <laughs> hope, hope you didn't read that. What uh, physical finding is being demonstrated here in the lower right panel? Anyone can? Has to be a resonant. Has to be a resonant. So that's correct. This is Munson's sign. So what, we're, what, we're, what you should appreciate here is that there is a cone-shaped depression of the lower eyelid when the patient is instructed to look down. And this is simply just a deflection of the cone-shaped cornea. So ocular double pass light scattering um, in this instance by an OCUS-2 instrument or optical quality analysis system 2 uses an infrared laser diode shown through a collimator and then through a pinhole which then enters through the visual system, reflects off the retina, back through the visual system once more and then through a second pinhole to a camera which collects this double pass image. And in doing so, this collects the forward and reverse scattering of light <coughs> by the patient's visual system. So in essence, you're able to see what the patient's retina sees. Now, to contrast this with reverse light scattering, which is a more familiar concept to most of us um, in our day-to-day -day slit lamp biomicroscopy, reverse light scattering is quite easily observed. You can just shine a light in someone's eye and you'll see it whereas opposed to forward light scattering, which really you need some sort of instrumentation to observe. Reverse light scattering, um, as you're well aware, is not representative of how an aberration in the visual system affects their uh, patient's vision. Um, we've all seen this when we look in the patient's eye and we see a really dense cataract that apparently they're able to see fine through and uh, doesn't seem to bother them that much. This is opposed to forward light scattering, which really defines the quality of that patient's vision. Reverse light scattering is, again, not directly related to the image cast on the retina, but forward light scattering actually has the ability to reconstruct images which are cast on the retina uh, using some mathematical tools. So shown here is an example of an output from an OCUS-2 machine um, with a reconstruction of a patient's vision alongside their objective scatter index, or OSI, which is simply just the ratio of scattered light to the central unscattered light <coughs> multiplied times a constant. And you can see here for this patient who has an OSI of 2.5, they do have some blurring of their vision, and this is associated with um, the Snell and I uh, visual acuities of approximately 20 over 30. So the clinical questions we had were, does ocular double pass light scattering increase in keratoconus, and can we use a representative of this the objective scatter index, which I just previously mentioned, as a diagnosis and staging tool. So this was a retrospective study. Um, we included both patients who um, were being uh, considered for refractive surgery as well as those who um, initially presented for keratoconus. We excluded children as well as those who had previous ocular surgery or lens opacities. 43 eyes were included in the study, 22 keratoconics and 21 controls. And everyone underwent a clinical exam, including evaluation for uh, best corrective visual acuity, <coughs> as well as 
um, imaging on the double pass light scattering device, placidus topography by the Atlas, and Scheint fluid tomography, tomography by the Pentacam. Um, these patients were then, with just their topography, tomography, and clinical exam, categorized using the Amsler crew mic scale for keratoconus severity, as well as the keratoconus severity scale, or KSS. So to jump right into the data, if you look at panel A up here in the top right, you can see that the objective scatter index, or OSI, is increased in keratoconic patients in comparison to controls. <coughs> However, there is a large amount of variability within these data. When you split it apart by keratoconus severity score, that is grades one and two, which are uh, suspect topography, whereas grades three and four are mild and moderate keratoconics, so frank keratoconus, you can see that really only KSS grades three and four have an elevation in their OSI values. This is to be contrasted with the Amsler crew mic, older scale, um, but still clinically used, which has elevations in all grades examined. So the next question was, well, how good of a diagnostic test is this OSI? <coughs> to answer this, we used uh, receiver operating characteristic studies um, and generated these curves. So for a perfect study, you would expect the line to go all the way up the y-axis and then straight across, whereas for a coin flip, you would get a horizontal line or diagonal line directly across the, um, from, from the origin here. A perfect test has an area under the curve then of 1.0, whereas in an imperfect test, a coin flip has an area underneath the curve of 0.5. So anything in between is better or worse, depending on how close it gets to one. Just kind of as an example uh, of a good, not perfect test, is tear breakup time for predicting dry eye symptoms has an area under the curve of about 0.79, whereas a particularly bad test, prostate specific antigen, quite poorly named if you ask me, uh, to predict progression uh, or um, presence of prostate cancer has an area of the curve of only 0.68. So just to kind of give you some, you know, rule of thumb type measurements to compare these studies. So what we observe is in comparing controls versus any, any KSS grade, any keratoconic grade, including the suspects, we get an area under the curve of 0.86, telling us that this is a fairly good test for being able to determine if someone is a suspect or keratoconic in comparing whether or not, but, but when we break this apart to looking at just the suspect eyes, KSS grades one and two, we can see that the AUC sig falls significantly, telling us that really this test isn't very good at detecting suspect topography, that is KSS grades one and two. And as expected, if you um, limit the test to only looking at the mild and moderate keratoconics, this is a great test. You can see it has an AUC of 0.99. But most interestingly, and this is, this is probably the most important piece of data I'll show today, is that when you look at keratoconics or, or suspect keratoconics, KSS grades one and two, versus people who actually have frank keratoconus in KSS grades three and four, we get an area under the curve of approximately 0.95, which is great. What it's telling us is that we're able to discern suspect topography from people who actually have keratoconus, as determined by the KSS scale. Yes, sir. They could develop, that's right. <coughs> so in the next series of slides, I'm going to display um, our data where we look at the point spread function, that is the um, double pass light scattering where a single point of light is then scattered along with the OSI values, the objective scatter index, which again is just the amount of peripheral light intensity versus the amount of central or unscattered light intensity. So higher OSIs mean more scattering. I'm gonna show this in conjunction with um, Atlas topography, Placida disk topography, as well as Scheint fluid pentacam tomography on the bottom row. And as you can see here in this control patient, there's a symmetric bow tie type appearance, which is indicative in this case of some against the rule astigmatism, regular astigmatism. When we look at KSS grades one through four, we can see that there is an increasing amount of light scatter as evidenced by increasing um, widening of this cone. 
of the point spread function. So you can see this is wider than the control group. KSS2 is wider and more irregular. KSS3 and KSS4, um, in actual keratoconus, you can see that there's a significant amount of widening. And these are associated with increasing OSI values. Similarly, when we look at the KSS grades one through four, we can see an increasing amount of steepening as evidenced by topography um, and as is common in, in, a, in you know, large um, aberrations, corneal aberrations, topography isn't uh, terribly good at picking it up. Where, however, this is picked up by tomography. You can see that these inferior steepening patterns in KSS1 and KSS2 um, progress to um, even greater amounts of inferior steepening in KSS grades three and four. So in summary, uh, combined with topography and tomography, this objective scatter index provides a decent diagnostic tool. Um, it was found to be significantly increased with KSS grades three and higher and had a significantly large area underneath the curve in comparing controls versus these grades. Double pass light scattering is um, is probably even better as a tool for following keratoconus patients. So when comparing uh, those patients who had KSS grades one and two versus those who had three and higher, we actually got an area underneath the curve of 0.95, which was a phenomenal test. Um, so with that, I'll open the floor. These are my references. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, um, including Dr. Waring, the uh, principal investigator on this study, as well as my sources of funding there at the bottom. So with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. I don't have that number at the tip of my tongue, but I did note that there was some apical scarring. Um, we, so one of the criteria for the KSS scale is um, apical scarring or um, clinical findings uh, such as uh, Rizzuti sign or uh, um, I'm blanking on the name of it right now. The uh, vertical striae, uh, bo boat striae. So there, there are. I just don't have that number. I'm sorry. <laughs> It was a great question. So he's asking, you know, did we follow patients? No, this was just a cross-sectional, you know, kind of retrospective type study. I think that's an important study to do to see if this actually becomes a good predictor. So we were able to discern from KSS grades one and two and three and four here, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same as following a patient who had KSS one and two for a period of time. Um, I didn't do that analysis specifically, but there was no significant difference, so I would expect it's a pretty low area underneath the curve. For, for grades one and two, the area underneath the curve was 0.6. And I can so it was the test for the Correct. So the clinical utility would be to follow patients who you think might be developing keratoconus or to look at patients with keratoconus or mild keratoconus who you are afraid of might have um, bad visual quality since this is able to reconstruct the quality of vision that they are able to observe. No, sir. Dr. Petty? How do we know from this test then? You said probably this was a treatment plan or something like that. But it could be for the same patient. Um, we see a lot of new technology that come along, and am I trying to really balance what is the utility of doing a test like this to kind of see what might be important versus relying on the function uh, and, and better perception of function to tell you what you're doing? So really, that, that's, I guess, my take is that's a great device for someone else. Right. Um, 
you know, in the, in the rare instances where we have nonverbal patients, this would be an excellent way, you know, to measure, measure their visual acuity. Um, but I will say that it, 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 you get on, on, on a slippery slope when you want to do this for every single patient who's able to tell you that their vision is terrible. Um, I, think, I think it's more useful for uh, clinical studies. So if you are doing some sort of um, optical system intervention, you know, interocular lens implant, intacts, you know, what have you, this would be a great way to tell if, to compare interventions. Because it then gives you a continuous variable which you can test very readily with statistics. Yes? So is it worthwhile to show this uh, bus test to uh, people who visit Charlie at night? Uh, yes, they've done those studies in the past. Um, Pablo Artal is one of the developers of this technology. Uh, Dr. Waring was actually just in his lab yesterday. Um, they have done a lot of the studies which give those um, relative uh, correlations of OSI values with BCVA. They haven't looked at it specifically in keratoconus. But they, they have looked at it extensively with lens opacity. How does OSI correlate with this work on optometry or optometry? So wavefront aberrometry, if I'm not mistaken, measures the way that the cornea will, it's a ray tracing type tool where you shine a ray and then you see where that ray goes. So that is a form of forward light scattering analysis. What it doesn't pick up is the, um, a, the, the continuous, any aberrations continuous in the optical system. So if there's any vitreous or anterior uh, chamber opacities or lens opacities for that matter. There are no further questions. Thank you for your attention.